All right, hello, Honors 410. Uh, I'm gonna do my best today uh, to keep the video lecture relatively short. Um, we do have another um, group-led discussion video, uh, and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time and give you an opportunity to not only listen to what I have to say, uh, but also to, to engage with that material. Um, so I'll, I'll dive right in here. Um, first off, I just want to um, say uh, thank you to the uh, first folks to do the uh, communal writing project for us. Um, I thought those came across uh, really well. Uh, a part of why I'm not super prescriptive about giving guidelines for um, you know, what those should or should not include um, it's because I think there there is real value in just kind of leaving it open ended and seeing what people come up with. Um, and true to form, um, I thought these were three very different, uh, very interesting beginnings of stories. Um, so each of those students, um, I did give you some uh, feedback notes uh, and your scores on Canvas. So if you haven't seen that yet, feel free to you know go ahead and look at that. Um, but again, make sure that you're you're reading all of these um, in part just you know for your enrichment and so we can discuss these things on the discussion board. Um, but then also especially so because uh, for those of you who are coming up in the progression. Um, you'll want to see kind of you know where the story is going and start collecting your own ideas. Um, you know the second part of this communal writing project um, is due tomorrow, so there's three more students up for that, and then we just kind of keep going um, in that kind of rhythm moving forward. So um, you know it could be a challenging thing if you're just trying to catch up on reading them right before you write your own part. Um, so to make sure you're following along and thinking about what's happening in these stories, um, and there's going to be a degree to which they they sort of you know go off the rails so to speak a little bit. They're not necessarily going to match up with the author's um, original intentions every single time. Um, that's to be expected. That, that could even be a good thing, I, I would argue, to some extent. Um, but trying to, to be consistent in terms of things like tone and some of what the previous authors have set up for you so it's not feeling like it's just sort of a, a random, you know, leap off, but rather sticking with the same story. Um, also wanted to thank um, our first group to leave a group-led discussion video. Uh, I thought it was excellent, um, so I also really appreciate uh, the hard work that, that clearly went into that. Um, and similarly, uh, I've given some feedback notes to them as well as, as their scores in Canvas. So, um, you know, for those students, please make sure you can see those as well. Uh, and let me know if you have questions. But, um, but okay, so with all that said, um, so we'll continue some degree of discussion around Aloft based on uh, what our group-led discussion video for today says. Um, but I'm going to just kind of go straight ahead uh, into Rain, the, the second novella we're reading for this class. Um, our focus is going to be on Rain moving forward, um, as I hope groups three and four are very clear on it this point um, that their focus is to be on the novella rain um, but now that we all have kind of the common framework of having read aloft and going into rain we certainly uh, can compare the two in some way some of you've already started to do that in your reading response journals and like that that's great uh, but thinking about what the differences are what, what hill might be getting at on a larger level um, we'll focus on rain at least for the purposes of my lectures mostly in isolation is kind of its own piece um, but they, they don't exist in total isolation though right they're in the same book by the same author uh, in, in juxtaposition with each other right right next to each other so you that, that all has some degree of purpose to it um and one, one other note that I'll make. So, so in this book, there are four separate novellas um, included here. Um, so Snapshot, um, I do have listed as an extra credit opportunity. Uh, if you wanted to read that on your own, uh, if you've liked the, the rest of what we've read, I expect you probably would enjoy um, Snapshot as well. Uh, but it is a significant reading assignment. I'm just flipping through my copy of the book here, and it thinks about, you know, 90 pages. Uh, I think it reads relatively quickly. If anything, maybe even a little bit more quickly than the other Hill novellas that we've read. Uh, but it is a lot of pages. Ages. So if you're someone who's kind of, you know, just struggling to keep your head above water with the reading, that this might not make sense as an extra credit assignment for you to take on. Uh, but if you've just been breezing through and really enjoying this, uh, you might have fun with that one as well. And again, you can earn three points of extra credit uh, just from reading and writing that that response to it. Um, the other novella here, Loaded, um, is the only one in this uh, collection of novellas that is not speculative in nature. Um, it's pretty straightforward, realistic um, fiction. Um, I, I'm super torn on it. Uh, to be transparent, as, as you would guess sort of by the title and by, by the image on the, on the title page of it. Um, it does deal heavily in gun violence. Um, so if that's a trigger for anyone, this may not be a comfortable read for you. Um, but uh, I, I would suggest it's a, it's a good novella. I, I think in some ways, I think it's um, Hill's kind of 
the one he demonstrates the most skill in in this book as a literary writer, um, but again, can be uncomfortable and, and it doesn't really fit the speculative themes of the class, which is the main reason why I chose not to assign it here. Uh, but folks who are interested, you know, it's there. You, you own the book now, most of you, so, uh, you know, take advantage of that as you have time uh, if you're interested. But okay, so to, enough about Hill at large, though. Let, let, let's go on into uh, Rain specifically. And I want to spend some time just on, on the first page of this thing here. Um, and, you know, like we did for um, Aloft, I want to just read the first sentence again. Um, when the rain fell, most everyone was caught outside in it. Um, so it, it's a relatively straightforward first line. And um, I would say in some ways it sort of shows a degree of subtlety here um, that, that Hill's a little bit withholding about it being um, this deadly rain, right? Um, we, we learn that pretty quickly in here, uh, but it sounds almost kind of pedestrian, just this idea of um, when, it, when it rained, um, you know, everyone was, was outside. Um, a lot of us have been in that situation, right? Especially people li living here in Nevada, um, you know, where we don't expect rain to happen very often. So when it does happen, I think a lot of us tend to be caught off guard. So, um, you know, I think that that's, that's sort of an immediately relatable um, introduction but also the, the choice to encompass everyone was caught outside, right? Just kind of immediately asserting this was sort of a communal event that, that this, this impacted a lot of people. Uh, if people have other reactions, I'd, I'd love to hear about those in the discussion thread as well. Uh, but moving on to, to the next paragraph, though, it starts with you. So you wonder maybe why so many people died in that initial downpour, and it goes on from there. Um, and I was curious about our reaction to the, the use of you here, right? Um, anyone who's taken a, a number of English classes um, has probably heard at one point or another not to use you. And the, the rules are a little bit different with, with fiction and with creative writing in general. Um, but but it's still, it's, it feels like a really pointed choice, especially it's literally the second sentence. The first word of the second sentence of the story is you. Um, so clearly um, our, our point of view character here um, is not holding back from using it, right? And I think some of it's establishing voice. Um, but some of it is speaking to that um, you may, may actually have an experience with this. You, you may have heard about the incident that she's referring to. Um, so, so in any event, I, I'll hold back on saying more about that at this moment. But I'm interested in the impact of the you and how, how people read that, how they understood it, um, you know, what, what we kind of make of that. Um, for, for the third paragraph here, um, we meet Martina. Uh, we, and we, we meet Martina as Martina, the Russian stripper who lived in the apartment below mine, um, who was out in our dusty scrap of yard, sunning herself in a black bikini so tiny it felt like you ought to have to feed machine quarters to keep looking at her. That's a pretty vivid description, right? Um, so so we, we meet this character. We get a degree of, um, you know, physical description of her. Um, but I'm, I'm curious what people make of this, right? Um, and so I, I would suggest in this description, in, in you know, saying that uh, she was a stripper, um, in, in, you know, noting what she was wearing, and this idea of, you know, feeding change in it to keep looking at her, that there's a sense of something vaguely almost pornographic to this, right? Uh, um, a sense of kind of real world grit, I would suggest. So um, we're not not in a very polished kind of innocent kind of place. Um, you know, and I, and I wouldn't really call um, the, the voice in a loft very, very innocent or the nature of that story, you know, su super, you know, childlike or, or innocent either. Um, but I would suggest that we're immediately kind of, you know, getting shoved into the, this more clearly adult world in this one and one where um, things are not going to be very sanitized for us, where the author is going to speak pretty frankly, or I should say that the narrator is going to speak pretty frankly to us. Um, so, so in any event, I think all, all of that's, you know, worth taking some note of. Um, on page 335, so jumping ahead a, a couple pages here, um, there's uh, th this reference to uh, the, the, the preacher here, uh, Yolanda's father. Um, and there's this line I really love, the end of the uh, second paragraph, um, where it says, All good preachers have a little of the devil in them. Um, and I, I'm just going to let that one stand there. Um, so uh, r rather than putting forth my interpretation, um, I think we, we all can have our own interpretations. I think at minimum, um, it's kind of a an interesting kind of ironic line, because I think kind of intuitively, um, it feels almost like a paradox, right, that, that a preacher would have the devil in them. Um, but I think we can we can reason out what, what this means. Um, and, and this kind of goes beyond just the confines of the story, but something about um, Honeysuckle's worldview, uh, it's something that I would suspect many of us can, can relate to, or if not not relate to maybe we even disagree with honeysuckle but but at least we can understand what what she's saying so uh, I'm curious uh, about your interpretations uh, and, and why Hill would include that there um, okay Jeb and I had another couple pages here to 338 um, let's see in the second to last paragraph here um, 
so, so there, there's this moment when we're talking about Templeton, um, the, the neighbor's son, um, and she describes that, that he, for a moment, forgets to act like an invalid. Um, which, yeah, I think it's sort of an interesting moment. Um, and I would suggest in some ways it almost links up to um, in a loft when, um, when Aubrey forgets that he was afraid of heights, right? Where you don't just forget that you're afraid of heights. It's not the kind of thing you forget. It's the kind of an embedded fear in most cases. Um, and yet that particular circumstance kind of, you know, ch shifts things for him. Um, I think something similar, but, but not quite the same is happening with Templeton here, right? Where he, he forgets to act like an invalid. Um, I think to an extent to, to address it, I think that there is a reference to kind of just the severity, the, the you know, level of threat in the situation. Um, but I think there's also something being said about Templeton and perhaps about his relationship to his mother here. Um, so, so again, I'll, I'll leave that there, but I'm interested to hear, you know, what the class would make of that on 338. Again, that's in the, the second to last paragraph there. Um, but okay, jumping ahead a little bit more to 344 here. Um, so, so here we get some discussion of, um, and this is in the, the first full paragraph, kind of the, the second paragraph, um, you know, as it would kind of appear on the page here. Um, but we get some references to the president and the vice president. Uh, and I'm going to tread lightly here. Um, so to, to be transparent, obviously, like, like I think most people in this day and age, I have my own political views. Um, I consider it pretty staunchly not my job to foist those views upon you. So I'm, I'm not necessarily going to get into what I personally um, think of uh, our, our current administration. But I, I guess I'll say that I, I think it's relatively clear that Hill, Hill is referencing um, President Trump and Vice President Pence here, right? Um, so... Um, it's an interesting choice, I think, and you know, he references Twitter, which is one of the ways in which we know that this is, you know, pretty much our, our modern times. Um, and just, you know, given kind of the, the all caps and kind of, you know, profanity, I think there's a pretty clear implication that, that he's referencing Trump there. And given the, the vice president's references to prayer, that, that sounds sort of, you know, what we would, you know, sort of stereotypically think of, of uh, Mike Pence's kind of response to something. Um, so I, I was curious what we think of this choice, because he doesn't name them, right? Because I, I think that would actually be, in some ways, a more straightforward move to just directly, you know, call them by name. Um, why he chooses not to um, n name them there and, and why he says that, you know, Twitter is not cutting it here. Um, and, and, and what we kind of understand about Honeysuckle based on the way she's characterizing um, their responses to this thing. I think all, all of that's worth con considering here. Um, anytime that, that an author kind of invokes something sort of, you know, more contemporary or something from the real world, um, I'll, I'll be transparent. There, there is a risk associated in terms of if you want your, your work to be timeless, um, you are kind of very specifically dating it. Um, and when you choose not to name uh, the politicians involved here, um, there's a risk that, you know, someone's reading this, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, maybe they don't know who you're talking about, right? Um, so, so why we think Hill might make those choices, what, what the effect is, and again, what, what that might tell us um, about Honeysuckle. Um, but okay, so, so I'm gonna, again, I'm, I'm kind of steamrolling through here, um, in part because I want to make sure that um, the people doing group-led discussions three and four have plenty of stuff to talk about that we haven't yet. So uh, I'm going to jump to um, our second reading here. Because again, um, you know, we had a, a set for Monday, you had a set for today, um, and we, we sort of, you know, didn't talk about it yesterday because I wanted to give full attention to um, student work with the group-led discussion and the um, the creative, or the communal uh, writing project uh, entries. So, so let's cut ahead to our, our second reading here. Um, it's really to page 365 here. Um, so, you know, towards the end of this thing, um, we, we get this image here. Let's see if I can find the spot that I was looking for. Um, yeah, so of, of this person who's basically impaled on, on a tree branch, right, which is a pretty um, harsh kind of visceral image. And we get a, a number of those in, in this novella, right? This isn't the first one. It's not the last one. Um, but I'm curious of the, of the impact of that image of, of this person kind of impaled from the tree, um, what, what that does for us. I, I think that there is sort of a immediate kind of, you know, again, visceral sort of response we could have of like, that, that's gruesome, that's disgusting, that's horrible. Um, I would argue that um, Hill also has a degree of kind of dark, almost humor kind of embedded in here, right? And, and I'm curious about what, what the effect of that is to people. Um, and, and additionally, th there's so many people who have died uh, in this situation, right? This is, this is kind of portrayed as this big catastrophic event where a lot of people lose their lives. Um, what the impact is of capturing just this one body, because it's not the only one we could have captured, right? But we, we do focus on this one for a little bit. Um, 
And, and on a not totally unrelated note, um, I want to bring up M Mark Despot, um, a, a pun name for sure, um, and his cat Roswell. Um, and, and what we make of these characters, um, why we feel like they're included here, what, what their relationship with Honeysuckle is like. Um, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here, right? Um, and, and I would suggest that, that Mark doesn't feel all that much like a kind of traditional um, literary character to me. Um, and, and I think in some ways um, that, that's especially provocative here. I think Hill kind of knows what he's doing in casting him with Honeysuckle. Um, I think there are some similarities between them, but probably more marked differences. Um, so, so why he would choose to include this character in this situation with his cat who uh, isn't long for this world, um, you know, why he'll chooses to include all that and, and its impact on us. Um, continuing ahead here, from page uh, 375 to 376 here, um, we, we get the, um, she's described as a PTA mom, um, where, where, um, she ends up, uh, taking the phone after Honeysuckle kind of gets attacked and sort of mugged. Um, she, she ends up, um, you know, kind of coming upon the scenario. It's unclear how she's going to act, what side she's going to fall on, if she's going to kind of mind her own business. Um, she ends up taking the phone, right? Honeysuckle's phone. Um, and it, it's such a wild scene, right? Um, cause it's something that, um, I hope for at least most of us is really unfamiliar from our, our life experience. Um, what we make of this scene, what we, we make of it kind of um, Hill casting this, again, PTA mom as he characterizes her, um, taking the phone and just kind of walking away, um, what, what this scene overall tells us about the, the situation that, that we're in. Um, and then I'm going to wrap up um, today's video lecture, which is kind of um, a more a broader note um, about we, we have this character who Honeysuckle describes as Gumby, right, or, or being Gumby-like. Um, and it's established that, that he has a grudge with um, Yolanda and Yolanda's whole family. Um, so so I, I'm not I'm not you know prying for anything that's sort of you know hidden in the text or that it's super subtle. Um, but I I do want to make sure just because there's so much going on in the develop to this point that people understand what the relationship dynamics are between these characters. So I'm just gonna raise it as one more kind of open ended discussion thread question. Um, wh why he doesn't like Yolanda or her family? Um, what what the root issue seems to be there? Um, and kind of what what we make of that and what it tells us about um the world the hill is kind of portraying here. Um, and particularly in, in the context of, of the situation that all these characters find themselves in. Um, so, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to cut it off there. Again, I know, I know we have um, you know, a, a solid you know, 15, 20 minutes of uh, video from our group to digest as well. So thanks as always for watching. Um, a reminder that on Thursday at 1 p.m. I am planning to offer an optional live session. Um, I believe it's going to be on WebEx. I'm, st I'm still working out the, the logistics of that. I hope tomorrow to give you more, more concrete details about all of that. Um, but yeah, th thanks as always for, for engaging with everything, um, and I'll see you all tomorrow.